Hello, this is John Nagarjuna Anhalt, and I'm going to be doing a small stakes session video for you. This is going to be 50 no limit, 100 no limit, 6 max. We're going to be using specific hands and going through a lot of different concepts and ideas about how to scoop small pots, um, make plays, re-steal, and how to think about a lot of situations to really maximize your value. Um, you hopefully should learn a good deal from this video. There might be some concepts that you're somewhat familiar with. I hope I can break those down in more detail and make them more clear for you. Um, so really everything in poker comes down to maximizing every opportunity that you can um, find and, and doing it. Um, one of the major differences between uh, marginal winning players and, and somewhat decent players to the good players is really capitalizing on all of those opportunities that are at the table. Um, and in order to do that, you need to, of course, know what those opportunities are. You need to be able to recognize them and be able to uh, find them. Um, and in order to do that, you need to be able to pay attention and be actively looking for them all the time. Uh, no matter how many tables you're playing, um, I typically play around six or seven tables at a time. Um, when these hands are done, they're done with only um, four tables at a time. But regardless, um, you should be able to find some kind of comfort zone for yourself to maximize uh, all of these potential opportunities to come up because they come up a lot. And I can just say from um, having coached from, for many years, um, a lot of small and mid-stakes players that there's a lot of spots that people miss constantly. Um, and so with that, since we're going to be going over a lot of different um, ideas, maybe some things, like I said, that you uh, have already kind of heard of, uh, heard of and, and do and some things that you may have never have thought about or tried. Um, Bad variance in small samples can really equal some bad conclusions. You could try a bluff or a play and it doesn't work and you'd be like, ah, oh, that's never going to happen. So um, in order to avoid bad conclusions in poker period about no matter what you're doing, um, you want to keep experimenting, testing your conclusions, sharing hand histories um, you know, on forums or with your friends, talking about poker, making sure that you that the main thing is that you're recognizing the situation properly um, and that you're, you're you know, executing. Um, what happens because of that is somewhat irrelevant. Um, just the, the main point is that you want to make sure that you're, you're recognizing the right spots and um, executing them properly. So to do this video, basically, I said I was going to play around 10,000 hands at few no limit, 100 no limit, 6 max, and go over and replay different hands I thought were um, interesting and kind of share my thoughts on them. Um, you know, in small samples, you can easily have crazy win rates and whatever um, is going on. I posted my stats here that came out um, from the session roughly about the same amount of uh, 100 no limit and 50 no limit hands, a little bit more 100 no limit. Um, and you can kind of get an idea of my stats and, and what I was playing. I would definitely say I was not playing um, really hyper aggressive because I, th I think there's some downfall on that, but just really, again, kind of recognizing the situations that I could steal or could bluff um, and capitalizing on those as much as possible. Um, not four betting a ton, I would say. Uh, you know, three betting a decent amount to a point where it's um, aggressive to possibly make somebody make some mistakes, but not over the top to where people can really exploit it. Um, and yeah, so without further ado, we're going to go over um, a number of these hands now. All right, so the first thing I'm going to go over is kind of how to make distinctions and whether you should be uh, flat calling or three betting a regular when a reg isos a fish and you have kind of a marginal but, you know, decent hand. Um, so I thought this hand kind of illustrated one of these points, and I'll show you um, a different one here after this. But So here we obviously have the fish and we have the reg. 
who is going to ISO fairly wide here, trying to get heads up in position against the fish. We have King Jack. Um, so a couple of things that you should be considering when you're trying to determine if you want a flat call or or three bet here. Um, one is when you have like really kind of marginally bad hands that you're not really looking to play post flop, something maybe like a king seven suited or something, this is a great spot to re-steal, of course. Now with king jack, we're strong enough to be ahead of both of these players' ranges. The problem, of course, is that we're out of position to both players. Um, so I'm always a huge advocate of trying to keep the fish in the pot as much as possible, um, even if it means taking you know slight hit on, on pre-flop uh, equity to keep the fish in there and possibly play a big pot with them. Um, this is usually a spot, though, that it's much better to 3-bet. Now, a couple things you want to consider are really how aggressive post-flop your reg is, who's ISOing, and also, um, you know, just your overall relative position. If we, for example, were on the button and the reg ISOed from the cutoff, then flat calling here would be more ideal because you have a better chance of having position on the reg and the fish and still having um, a good hand that you're ahead of both of their ranges. And there's a, obviously when you have position, there's a whole lot more that you can do. Um, but in this case, even though the, the reg isn't hugely or, or largely um, aggressive post-flop, um, three betting here is, is nice to uh, you know take down, um, what is it, seven or eight big blinds without even seeing a flop. That's that's a good win. Um, so that's uh, the kind of the out of position scenario. But there are times where you can take a, re uh, a reasonable hand when you're close to 100 big blinds out of position um, and keep the fish in. Let's say maybe we had ace 10 suited or something like that and um, your rig wasn't very aggressive post flop then you could um, you know take more chances there pre-flop and just look to call. But in general, um, these kinds of hands are good to re, um, basically steal. Um, and even on the lower end of your range, like I was saying, like a king seven suited or maybe like a, you know, a queen nine suited or something along those lines as well. That, that would be very standard in that case. So here again is another similar example. Um, fish limps in. Uh, pretty aggressive rig isos and you know you have queen seven here suited in the big blind um definitely since this is you know a hand that we're not looking to call and play post flop we're looking mainly to steal pre-flop um you know we re-raise and, and you can take down the pot you just you know have to recognize and take advantage of those um and mainly do them with hands that when you are called you have something so something with like a high card ace king queen um, would be nice if it's suited you know king three suited or whatever um, and not something for example like you know eight three offsuit or something to that effect um, you know technically if you really are confident you can do it with any two cards because you're mainly just looking to take it down but if you do get called, you want something that has some kind of uh, showdown value, uh, especially if you're doing it out of position, because it's it's uh, you know it's a lot harder to get to showdown. You want to be more confident. If you know the higher pair that you make, um, the more likely you are you can make it to showdown safely. Um, or you have to be looking to mix in um, a lot of bluffs, and um, which can obviously become much more complex. So. Um, those are a couple of common examples, and we'll go into something else. All right, so similar pre-flop strategy you can take advantage of, uh, three bet squeeze. You have a uh, regular who's a little bit too loose from early position, um, opening like 25% of their hands, and then kind of a fishy bad player calling, flat calling, you're on the button. Um, with a hand like this, uh, this is a pretty easy pot to take down a majority of the time um, because clearly, obviously, your opener who's way too loose is going to have to call a large raise out of position, worry about maybe being out of position against two players, um, and thus the squeeze is, is pretty effective there. Um, squeezing on the button is a great play. You just want to make sure that the person opening from under the gun 
um, or the hijack has a really, um, you know, a higher percentage from those positions. Um, so I specifically in my HUD, I keep those two numbers up there because I squeeze a lot in the cutoff or button um, when I see these numbers get really green. So my, uh, my, you know, my range will get really, really wide here and um, it's pretty effective. And also just as a general strategy against regs, when you start three betting them in position, um, it can get quite frustrating and you want to build that tension at the table so you could take advantage of it uh, in later situations. Okay, so this one I kind of like to call um, BS leading into the preflop razor. Um, you s I don't know, I found this a good amount at 50 no limit, a little less 100 no limit. Um, this stuff doesn't usually happen at 200, 400, 600 no limit and stuff. So um, it's interesting seeing it and I think it's pretty exploitable, but um, I'm sure you're familiar with this. And a lot of times, um, really actually an open button situation isn't the most ideal for this, um, but it does tend to happen um, a good amount. And I think at 50 no limit and under, you can uh, take advantage of this um, a good amount, um, at least experiment with it and um, see how you like it. So anyway, so you open the button, you get a call from some kind of bad player, queen high, pretty dry flop overall, and you get let into for three quarters of the pot. Um, usually when people are, are leading here, um, they have air, you know, sometimes they're going to have a draw, but, you know, it kind of depends. I mean, some of the better players obviously are going to check raise on this kind of board with a draw. Um, but um, sometimes, you know, it's bottom, middle pair, it's rarely top pair or better. Um, you know, if, you know, sometimes you are going to run into that, of course, um, and there will be certain players that just bet, 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 and um, they, that's just part of the overall uh, game strategy. But most of the time when you get let in, at let into like this, it's BS, and um, you can do yourself a favor by just, you make a really small raise, um, don't have to risk too much uh, to, to get folds in this scenario. And it's most ideal when you have something with like, you know, a backdoor draw um, or an overcard. In this case, I have, you know, two backdoor draws, backdoor straight draw, backdoor nut flush draw, um, and an overcard that's likely good. So um, you want to ideally do it in situations also where you have um, some kind of outs lingering out there. Um, you know, if I had, you know, something maybe like, uh, let's say, five, nine or something, then I probably wouldn't be as, as eager to do that. But again, there's a lot of these opportunities, so just... I'd say you can play around with them and uh, and experiment. It's a little bit different, of course, when you're multi-way. This same logic doesn't apply. I'm specifically talking about heads up, um, especially uh, you know if you open from the cutoff or the button, someone calls you from the blinds or whatever. You're going to get a lot of people just trying to basically re-steal, um, and you can apply a lot of a lot of pressure on them in those situations by just making a small raise. This is another kind of similar thing. Um, you, again, you don't see this a ton kind of at, at higher stakes because people know like there's a lot of BS going on. It usually ends up becoming a lot of uh, leveling if these situations do occur, but you kind of have um, a low paired board and, uh, you know, bet it and get check raise, especially check money raises. Um, I would definitely advocate in position if you have around 100 big blinds or more that you're calling and um, either you know looking to raise the turn or uh, you know bet if you're checked to. So in this case, it's simple. This person decides to check. I can again make another s small bet when the ace comes out and take down the pot. Um, you know you need to be careful with this one. Don't go overboard. Uh, I wouldn't advocate. Uh, triple barreling or anything of that nature but again it's something that you can experiment with most of the time on low paired boards uh, it's pretty much BS that people have something or they might have like a small pair like six or sevens and you have a lot of different things on the turn and river that can scare them off so um, 
yeah, in position if the pot's not too big and your stack to pot ratio is still, you know, staying pretty, uh, still has a lot of room to play with, then um, calling and kind of looking to, to re-steal on the turn is a good play. And if worse comes to worse, let's say a reg is doing it against you, um, you start building a little bit of a history as well, and they know, you know, you're going to be tough to play against uh, when you have position on them, so... Okay, so this one I kind of like to call my post-flop squeeze. Um, you find the right board textures. Um, this works great. I didn't have a. I thought I had another good example of this. I'm sure I do, but I, I couldn't find it. But um, so, anyways, you get um, you know probably likely a reg opening, a fish calling, and you have a fish that's kind of on the shorter stack side. You want to play this hand because you still, um, you know have some value and getting some money over here. You don't have to go completely crazy if you don't hit anything against the uh, the reg, but you could potentially also bust the reg. So uh, we flat call with 10 jack out position. Now I have completely dry board, king high. It's going to be very unlikely that someone's going to hit this very well um, with you know a backdoor flush draw and a backdoor straight draw. So. Um, can lead at these pots, don't have to lead big, and now you are essentially squeezing the pre-flop razor because, you know, they kind of have to have some kind of hand in order to go along. Uh, they have to be worried about the person behind them and so on. Uh, most of the time, especially if you pick the right board textures, you're going to get folds in this spot. Um, this particular case actually got a call, so um, was planning to actually make a small check raise here, assuming this person isn't going to have ace-king a huge percentage of the time, um, but it gets checked through, so that kind of tells me they have either some kind of weak king, um, you know, probably not so much um, an eight just because the person was a little bit tighter, I'm not too sure what kind of read I had on them at the, at the time, but definitely could have some other kind of pair like uh, queens, jacks, tens, all that kind of stuff, um, but you know, there's no showdown value here. Um, it's very likely we could have something like ace eight. We probably don't have ace king, of course. There's not a whole lot that we can rep beyond um, missed value uh, for a set, looking for um, a check raise on the turn or something like that. But um, you know, a, a huge portion of this person's range is going to be king x or something. So you kind of have to bet on the larger side um, to steal these kinds of pots. Um, but, uh, you know, a majority of the time, really, the point of this hand is is on the flop. Fly, finding good board textures where you start squeezing the pre-flop razor. Um, it's good, you know, especially like queen high. And if you happen to get like uh, a king or an ace or something like that on the turn, it just apply, there's just a lot of pressure that puts on the person to kind of have a big hand there. Um, then you're not going to expect you to be leading with this kind of hand. And the off chances when you hit some of your back door hands um, and they have something you can win uh, massive pots so it's a nice play all right so this one I like to call my little big double barrel and I almost hate even talking about this because um, I have been doing this for years still not very many people do this and um, I've worked with a lot of students and taught this, so um, and they've found great value in it. But um, essentially, you know, standard open, standard C bet, except your C bet is really small in relation to the pot overall, and even different than your uh, normal C bet sizing, um, which a lot of times will induce calls. Um, now, sometimes you're going to get raises in this spot. Um, I would say. Though really at 50 no limit and below, you can exploit this a ton. Um, 100, you know, against some regs, you're going to get a few more raids and stuff like that. But there's a ton of other things to do, like continue to call or to three bet the flop or just testing and seeing where someone's at. It's okay to like try something against a reg and see how they react. Sometimes you're going to be wrong, but um, if you don't try, you'll never know. So. Yeah, in essence, you're, you're betting small. Now, this isn't the best turn card to really um, double, per se, you know. 
Um, but the idea right from the start was to bet small on a totally dry flop, looking like I'm trying to squeeze some kind of value, and then bet large. Um, a lot of times, at least, really around the pot size, or sometimes even slightly overbet um, the turn. But you want to make sure, you know, it is it is a pretty dry board. You, if you get shoved on, you know, you're not committed in any way or anything close to that. So, yeah, so make a bet, get a fold. Pick up the extra money um, on the flop by making that small bet, getting someone to, to call. So, you know, you again, you want to make sure, you know, board texture is a big uh, piece of it. You don't want to be doing it on, you know, really highly coordinated boards or things like that. But let's say it's like queen, deuce, four, or something like that. Do the exact same thing. Small, um, and then very large, maybe slightly overbet um, on something like a queen high board because it's very probable someone has ace queen, queen jack, um, queen, you know, king queen, all that kind of stuff. So you really put a lot of uh, pressure on them. And uh, then you, if they, if you do get a call, then you just start doing it for value. Um, that's how you really start to maximize your value and um, you know as you know and the reason why I'm kind of talking about some of this stuff is because most of the players you're gonna be playing with are, are rigs especially nowadays um, you know even at, at these stakes so you want to make sure that you know you're trying different things against them seeing how they react and making good no uh, notes and exploiting them properly so this one I like to call my naked flop float and you need to be very specific about what kind of board textures and opponents that you're executing this on. My initial read, even though I didn't really have much on this opponent, was they were just um, looking to mix it up a lot. And uh, so, and with the board texture that comes out, I felt pretty confident that I could uh, make a play on the turn. Um, you know, if you're unsure, don't do it. Uh, here, you know, pretty standard open with king 10 and I get three bet from an aggressive fish. Uh, I'm going to call with a lot of hands in this situation. Um, and mostly also because they're going to have a lot of hands. Now, kind of a little bit of the oxymoron with these kinds of opponents is they're going to have a lot of hands. They're going to do some stupid stuff. So you do have to... Um, you know, until you get really good reads, you do have to make sure they're not going to be someone who's going to stack off with, like, you know, king three right here or, or something along those lines. Um, you got to at least hopefully have some kind of read that they're going to fold a little bit. They're not complete maniacs in nut cases. So, um, you know, here I'm obviously going to get a C bet from a ton of hands. Um, and there's not going to be a whole lot of hands beyond queens and above and someone who hit the jack that's going to continue on the turn and this is what I was really hoping for is you know getting the flush on the turn when I get checked to standard bet fold scoop the pot um, I'm looking for ideally very coordinated boards that I can represent um, that's not the most coordinated board but there's some coordination and it's helpful if there's like one single high card um, and you know especially in a spot where someone's going to be uh, three betting light um, they're gonna they're gonna whiff those kinds of uh, boards and are not want to continue um, you know enough you know if it's in a, a tighter three betting situation then you know you need to not try and execute that kind of plan so again it's kind of it's this situation um, and opponent and definitely um, board texture that you want to focus on. Um, you know, something like a 9, 10, 2 diamonds board, you know, with whatever other card. Um, there's going to be a ton of scary cards that you can that you can rep. Um, occasionally you're going to rep the hand that your opponent has and that is going to be part of bluffing, but more times than not, um, you're going to scoop pots from your opponents that um, that you would have not been able to so okay next so this one I call my uh, fried fish bluff um, there's really two variations of this um, but they are pretty much similar um, I mean essentially you're making uh, very highly profitable bluffs against 
fish in spots that are obviously weak or they preferably had tons of different draws that they whiffed on and you don't have to bet very much to uh, steal the pot when you don't have anything at the end. Um, so here, uh, you know, fish limps in, iso fish, king high flop, centered sea bet. Really, this is for value. Um, and get a call, check, going to check through on the, the turn and hoping to get another check on the river. And we get a check on the river, um, we know that either our fish has one of those three cards on the flop or some kind of draw that missed, unlikely to have a flush. So we can represent a flush. Um, in this spot, you have to bet a little bit on the higher end of what you would bet because you want to get the fish off the six and the four. Um, fish are fish and they're stations for a reason because they, they like to call bets, they don't like to fold. So, but you, you know, you still can obviously get them to fold, but in this spot, you need to bet a little bit larger. If something like a you know, eight, nine board with hearts and, and you get down to the end and they were checking and calling the whole time that you have king high or something, you can bet a very small amount, you know, a third of the pot or whatever and just get them off their, their whiff draws really, really cheap. Um, this one you have to go a little bit more on your higher end, like I was saying, um, to get the fold and scoop the pot. Uh, but, you know, fish are going to have something like, you know, five, seven, um, five, you know, three, five, like all sorts of different kinds of hands in a spot like this, and sometimes even ace high. So, um, you know, there's occasional time where you might even want to check down on certain boards, um, just to not have to risk anything if you have the best hand, but, uh, you know, there's a decent chance that, that your fish is going to have a six or a four here, and uh, you want to get them off that. They're most likely going to call you if they, if they have a king, of course. So, um, And when they do that, you'll lose. So this is another one of those fried fish bluffs, and I, I really just want to run through this real quick because there's just kind of one major point I wanted to make um, I thought was semi-important. But... Um, even though I'm not in ideal position here when I see whales this bad, like my range is going to get super, super wide. Um, I really want to try and play as many pots as possible in position against these guys. Um, and the main point I want to make here is when you have someone this wide, and obviously you're going to be calling with a whole lot of gut shots and draws, the same kind of thing we were uh, just talking about earlier in the other fried fish bluff. When I get the ideal double barrel card on the turn, um, I have to commit myself to tripling, assuming that, um, you know, I get checked to on the river. So I do get checked to, I want to make my bluff and get my opponent off of his, you know, do six or three. Um, so again, I have to bet a little bit on my larger side. Um, you know, sometimes he's going to check the flush to me, but, uh, still most of the time people won't. So, um, you know, you want to, follow through once you do make a plan um, with with your double because that's going to be a hard bet to call once you bet all three streets um, even for uh, a fish and again sometimes you're going to have those fish that will you know slow play some kind of random weird two pair or something or another it's it's going to happen sometimes but uh, more likely than not as long as you're capitalizing on the situations uh, consistently, you're, you'll take those down more than you'll get um, slow played. All right, uh, kind of debated on even putting this one in here, um, but this is kind of my rope a dope. Uh, don't do this a ton, but there are spots when it'll come up, and um, there's a couple of situations of it here in this. Uh, in these sessions that I played, but um, I'd go over one just because it's kind of funny. Uh, so, you know, limp in a small blind, I'm going to raise with a pretty wide range here, jack six, pretty standard. Um, get a lead into me, and uh, if you remember earlier in this video, we talked about leading into uh, pots like this um, is usually pretty weak. I have an over card and um, I have initiative in the hand, so I'm going to raise 
in this uh, instance I get called, but I love seeing the queen on the turn. That's a great card because I know that I can represent that at some point in the hand. I don't have to necessarily rep it on the turn. Um, so I can check through here, and basically my plan is if I do get checked here, I am going to uh, rope my opponent into making a dumb bluff because I know most of their range here is going to be a three, a four, um, some kind of busted straight draw or flush draw. It's going to be a huge part of their range. So I bet a very small amount. Um, you know, with stack size, I have to be careful, so I have to bet really, really small here. I, if I get shoved on, I'm kind of obviously screwed and oh well. But I'm hoping that I can get some kind of small re-raise that I can just shove back over the top. Well, in this case, I get that. It's an extremely small re-raise, so I don't have to worry about shoving. It just makes my um, job even easier. I don't have to make much of a re-raise, and I get my opponent to give up the hand. Um, just simply because, you know, there's not going to be a ton that they're going to have here, maybe other than 10-9. Um, uh, and he's probably, especially with how aggressive he is, going to do something on the flop. So I would really start thinking through what someone's hand range is by the time they get here in this spot. This is a very uh, profitable play if you're, you know, thinking through everything and the possibilities of what hands I might have. The fact that I, you know, have some initiative um, and I am three betting the river. So, um, but there's a number of factors that you obviously have to really pay attention to and and, and think through, including uh, stack size and that you're not messing yourself up. Um, this was an ideal stack size going on, so you kind of have to be careful. And um, that's kind of why I debated even uh, talking about this one, but um, there will be spots where you can get this to happen um, against aggressive opponents, and it's, um, it's a great way to just pick up extra money. Like, I could have just bet there at the end, and he probably would have folded. But um, I like to try and pick up a little extra money when I can. It's fun like that, I guess. So here's a free money play. This is really a pre-flop, and you know, doesn't happen a ton really, especially um, at 100 and 200 no limit. But every so often, you're gonna get um, some kind of limp parade, and you're gonna have some random hand. And even though it would be great if you were on the button, um, even out of position, uh, raising and trying to get uh, the hand heads up or, you know, at least one player um, so that you can uh, have the initiative, follow through with a C bet on the flop, you know, take down the pot, that kind of thing um, is a winning play. It's something that, again, it's one of those small scooped pots that you want to make sure that you're consistently taking advantage of because they do add up at the end of the day. Um, and, you know, if if you're unsure of your kind of your raising size, you have to experiment a little bit for whatever site you're on because uh, definitely some sites, you know, you could raise a very small amount and steal those pots and some you have to go a little bit larger. So you kind of need to play around a little bit with, with where that, that median is. Of course, you know, all opponents are going to be slightly different too, but there are some common themes and you want to try and uh, find those but you know make sure that you are grabbing those pots um, you know sure you could complete or something like that and then try and take a pot at a position against three players but um, even against bad players it's, it's not ideal you're not going to win that enough but you will win it a ton pre-flop and then you know you have some play post-flop all right, so when you end up coming through the back door, you want to make sure that you take advantage of it, um, definitely against fishy players. Um, don't think I took advantage of it as much as I should have in this particular hand, but um, uh, this was, you know, a decent spot, I guess. Um, so, you know, open raising, going to call this flop, going to see back. Of course, if I check, um, I'm not going to be able to do much of anything, um, you know, turn my flush draw don't need to bet a ton still um, because uh, you know I've had initiative from the start there's not really a huge reason for this person to uh, raise and get a call hit my back door now I'm hoping that they have at least an ace um, you know something that I'm gonna get paid off or whatever 
uh, really in these spots I advocate betting at least pot sometimes over and really balancing it with those times when you are um, over betting on the Turner River with bluffs but um, you know didn't in this case but still uh, got my call to at least get my pot size uh, bluff in there but you know um, if I whiff on that uh, turn I mean on that river at a position I don't hit the back door um, on that kind of flop probably giving up because um, it's you know there's very few cards that I'm gonna see that I'm gonna be able to get them off of um, by the river so um, but you know the main point is when you do hit your back doors you really want to bet large because they are much more surprising especially um, on on ace high flops um, get max value in those situations this is one of those uh, free money spots um, I'm sure you've seen this a ton of times you've probably even done it yourself um, but uh, multi-way pot uh, King Queen gets checked through. Uh, flush card comes on the turn, still checked through. Inconsequential card on the river. Um, unless someone had pocket sixes or maybe eight six or something, uh, you are going to scoop this pot. Um, ideally, it's better, you know, when you have. Uh, when it's multi-way with only two other opponents, the more opponents, the more difficult and uh, the more successful it has to be. Um, but there are boards that come off like this, and especially on things like, let's say, a 9-10 or 10-jack board or something like that that gets coordinated, and a pre-flop raiser checks that through, and it gets checked through again. Um, no one's going to be slow playing on that those kinds of board textures, so you can oftentimes, you know, bed or check raise or something and steal those pots a huge percentage of the time so you just uh, want to be aware of those you know the more coordinated they are and the less action they, that, that there are because that will happen multi-way um, then those are pots that just nobody nobody has anything or no one's going to be looking to really um, take anything down so the more coordination the more checks equals the weaker the hand and the more free money available all right, so hope you enjoyed the video and you got to learn a couple things. Basically, just experiment. Um, if there's a couple things you saw in the video you want to try, play around with them, stay patient. Um, definitely, you know, don't draw your conclusions too fast. Uh, share your experiences with your fellow poker players and on forums and get feedback and opinion. And um, do things so that you're getting your opponents to have to think about a situation, uh, especially your multi-tabling regs, because you'll find that if you do something that makes them have to stop and think, a lot of times you'll get a lot more folds. Um, that's not necessarily the case with weaker players or fish. A lot of times if you get them confused, confused can confusion can lead to curiosity, which can lead to more calls. So um, you want to be careful about that. But against your regs, do some things that get them to stop and actually have to go through and, and think about a situation. And you're going to find um, a lot more folds as well. So um, hope you're out there scooping a few more pots. This has been John Anhalt for Leakbuster. Take care.